that lock I'm gonna hold the back end of the okay. situated. Hello everyone, I'm Chris Goodwin with Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium here in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Join us next week for History's Lunch when author and Western Carolina University Associate Professor Robert Hunt Ferguson will present Remaking Race and Labor in Rural Mississippi, the Saga of Providence Cooperative Farm. Today, we are delighted to have our old friend Curtis Wilkie with us to discuss his new book, When Evil Lived in Laurel, The White Knights, and the Murder of Vernon Damer. Curtis Wilkie covered civil rights activity in Mississippi in the 1960s and afterwards served as a national and international correspondent for the Boston Globe. After nearly 40 years as a newspaper reporter, he joined the journalism faculty at his alma mater, the University of Mississippi, where he worked another 19 years before retiring at the start of 2021. Help me welcome Curtis Wilkie. So, uh, Chris, thank you, and it's nice to be here in, uh, in this particularly nice uh, facility. And I think the last time I spoke at one of these, it was at the, uh, one of the, the older buildings, but this is terrific. And in, in, in the shadow of the Civil Rights Museum, we, we just went in and looked at the, uh, the part of the exhibit and uh, the one particularly uh, illustrating the... Uh, the Damer murder, which is a central part of this book that I've written. Uh, before I get started, I just want to recognize my traveling companions today, uh, my dear friend Mimi Graves from Memphis, to whom the book is dedicated. And next to her is a son of Tom Landrum, one of the heroes along with Vernon Damer in the book, and his wife Amy, uh, the, their uh, Glad to have uh, be in their company, and, and also glad to see so many familiar faces behind those masks. I hope I'm recognizing everybody, but I see a, a lot of old friends here, so thank you for coming out. Um, I, uh, you you kind of know what it is, and I've got a cheat sheet here, but I don't really have any uh, specially prepared remarks. I'm going to ramble a little bit and then I'll uh, make myself available for some questions. But obviously from the book title, it involves uh, the White Knights uh, in uh, uh, primarily in Jones County and Forest County and their activities in the uh, 60s. Um, at the front of the book, I used a quote that I've always liked from Edmund Burke, and uh, God, I mangled it last night trying to mention it at uh, Square Books in Oxford. I don't know what happened, so I wrote it down to make sure that I get it right, but I, I've known it, but it, I blew it last night. But the quote, it's a famous one, says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And that is kind of a theme that resonates through the whole book, it is it it has a title of when evil lived in Laurel, and I got to go to Laurel tomorrow, so I don't know how well I'm gonna be received <laughs> there. But it also is about a, a lot of good men, and uh, uh, one of those good men uh, I got to know for the last year and a half or so of his life, and uh, maintain. A, friendship with other members of his family. And it uh, was a remarkable, courageous white man in Jones County named Tom Landrum. He was at that, at the book is set in from basically 65 to 69. And uh, he was a youth court counselor. He was 33 years old, married, had five children. Um, and he worked at the courthouse in Jones County uh, 
there was circuit clerk was uh, his office was in the courthouse and uh, his his name was Leonard Caves and he was a member of the White Knights. So thank you very much. You know, this is the guy that's in charge of voter registration in uh, Jones County as well as um, uh, providing jury lists for anything that's going to be tried in circuit court. So he made sure that the juries were all, uh, uh, in the list would include at least one Klansman who could hang any kind of jury. So uh, Leonard Caves was trying to recruit Tom Landrum to say, why, why don't you join with the rest of us fellows and white knights? And he resisted. And then he was approached by another friend, a, a guy named Bob Lee, who was the local FBI agent in Laurel, who appealed to him to join the Klan and report on their activities to the FBI. And Tom, after talking with his family and they prayed over it, uh, Tom and his wife, Ann, who's another hero in the book, and uh, Ann's mother, Tom's mother-in-law, uh, they, they actually took, took a family retreat for a week to consider whether he'd take this very risky assignment and he agreed to do so. And unlike a lot of the informants that the FBI would round up, he never got a penny for, uh, he was not a paid informant. He was somewhat troubled over the whole idea of being an informant. You know, I, I know in Ireland, they're the most hated people or the people that were informants during the Irish struggle against uh, the Brits. But uh, he finally felt this is something that he needed to do. This was one thing he could do because he was deeply troubled over uh, the White Knights activity and the violence that they were carrying out in Jones County and in the surrounding area. And don't forget that it was the White Knights and their operatives uh, in Neshoba County that carried out those horrific murders in 1964. And the imperial wizard of the White Knights was Sam Bowers, who basically orchestrated uh, uh, those murders in 64. And Bowers, of course, lived in Laurel, and he kind of is the evil incarnate that I refer to. Uh, he, he lived in his own jukebox business in Laurel called Sam Bolt Amusement Company. So uh, anyway, uh, Tom Landrum joined the Klan, and he was surprised to learn it's who some of the people were because they did more or less operate in secret. He saw some of his former students. He had been a school teacher and was disappointed to see that uh, they had wound up that way. Uh, but he. Uh, joined in. He never took part on any kind of mission, but uh, he tried to be an active member going to the meetings, and uh, not everybody wanted to take part in the missions. So uh, he served in that purpose for nearly four years. And uh, fast forward briefly to a few years ago, there was a book published, privately published out in Jones County by a former prosecutor who talked about the White Knights and mentioned in the book that Tom Landrum was one of the Klansmen. And at that point, Tom was troubled that he didn't want that to be part of his legacy. He had asked when he agreed to uh, uh, work with the FBI to get a letter from J. Edgar Hoover, then the director, that would just point out that, uh, okay, Tom Landrum may have been in the White Knights, but he joined it uh, to help us in our investigations. Anyway, he never got the letter from J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover was such a control freak, he didn't want to uh, uh, sign anything like that. So, to to kind of clear his name and also it's something that he was proud of and the family was proud of, they began to 
wonder what do we do because Tom Landrum during this whole period that he was filing reports to the FBI, he was saving them, saving a copy. And they read like a, not only a journal for the FBI, naming names and uh, uh, describing activities, but uh, uh, also it reads like a personal diary. He talks about his own emotions and it's uh, uh, several hundred pages of this that uh, Tom's wife, Ann, typed up and it's in the days of the carbon copies and she would send a carbon copy to her mother here in Jackson who saved them in a lockbox. So years later, it was available to the family to read and they thought, you know, surely maybe somebody would be interested in writing about this. And when I was approached, uh, about writing it and asked would I be interested. It was all done kind of secretively. I didn't even know uh, who, who the people were responsible for this approach, who, who was involved. And, but I said, sure, I'd be involved. You know, I covered a lot of the movement in Mississippi in the 60s. I worked for the uh, Clarksdale Press Register and uh, uh, was there from 63 to 69, kind of the uh, uh, some of the most important years of, of the, the whole movement. And, uh, you know, that's where I met Rims Barber for the first time. He would, he had come down here and wound up staying. So, uh, God bless you, you're still here with us. And Rims was uh, uh, another hero of, uh, from that time. And so many people that I got to know, Aaron Henry, who was the state president in WACP, he became my mentor. He taught me so much, uh, and I would see Aaron uh, just almost every day in, in Clarksdale, and uh, so many, so many of the heroes of the movement. One of the heroes of the movement I did not meet, but I was aware of his activities, was Vernon Damer, and he uh, lived uh, right outside of Hattiesburg in, in a place called Kelly Settlement, and. Uh, he was, you know, he, he, he's an unsung hero. He's not as widely known as he should be. Uh, he uh, was an incredible man. Uh, he was respected. He was a, a farmer. He had over 200 acres of land, but he also had a little country store next to his home. Uh, he was a, you know, a very active churchman. And after World War II, he became dedicated to voter registration, to uh, see that as many blacks as possible could be registered because he had suffered that uh, his own discrimination in 1949. The circuit clerk in uh, Forest County was a, a guy named Tucker and uh, he had been a party to purging the rolls, and basically purging rolls was to clear all the blacks who happened to be on the voting rolls to get their names off so they're no longer eligible to vote. So uh, Damer took this as a, basically as a personal insult, and it became a crusade of his. And uh, I know that uh, in the early 60s, before the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 65, uh, uh, Damer was one of the most active people in Mississippi in voter registration activities. And uh, at that time, uh, I was about the same age as so many of the young lawyers who came down here with the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. And uh, uh, some of them wound up working uh, closely with Vernon Damer in voter registration uh, in, uh, in the Hattiesburg area. And so uh, uh, this, this was the thing that he was involved in. He was a good friend of uh, Clyde Kennard, who was another black man and a neighbor of his who had tried to get into, uh, back then we called it Mississippi Southern, University of Southern Mississippi. And uh, this was before the Meredith uh, incident at Ole Miss. And he was denied, of course, uh, uh, any attempt to enroll at, uh, at Southern. 
and local authorities happened to arrest him and just happened to find a bag of seed and the car was obviously planted and they charged him with theft. And they happened to find whiskey in the car back when whiskey was allegedly illegal in the state. That's pretty funny. Uh, I see there's a new exhibit here uh, about uh, uh, life in uh, prohibition in Mississippi or something else most hypocritical era. And this was the darkest era. That was our most hypocritical. But this was, a, I see plenty of people with hair the color of mine that you remember, uh, these were tough times in Mississippi. And uh, some of the very brave people, you know, risked their lives. And Vernon Damer certainly, it cost him his life for what he did. But people like Tom Landrum risked their lives to, to, to be involved. So um, these were good men and they were good women who were involved to, you know, in the struggle. So Tom Landrum's papers came into my hands finally and uh, not before the family had bedded me ad adequately and uh, I'd met with the family and met with uh, Tom and began to get to know him and uh, they finally gave me this uh, very impressive uh, uh, set of uh, Tom Landrum's papers, Tom Landrum's journals, and they they formed the basis for my book. Uh, they're the the most important raw material that I had. I, I also uh, can draw upon some of my own memories of just that time and some of the characters involved and. Uh, then I discovered at the uh, University of Mississippi, uh, I'm sorry, you, well, Southern, okay, University of Southern Mississippi. Rick, sorry, not trying to muddle it too much, but uh, uh, they've got an incredible collection, valuable collection of civil rights material there, including the papers of uh, the guy who wound up being the lead prosecutor in Sam Bauer's final trial, which I covered. It's, uh, he's now a state judge, his name is Bob Helfrick. And uh, Bob Helfrick turned over what is essentially a treasure trove of FBI material that was confidential from that period that also, it, it complements uh, Tom Landrum's journals that I had and quite often I could find in the FBI papers things that clearly came directly from Tom Landrum and I was able to learn what his code name and number was with the FBI because I would see that this report came in from JN and some numbers that was his code um, so that also was very valuable uh, information for me, uh, one other uh, good man down there was, uh, at the time, was the county attorney, county prosecuting attorney, Charles Pickering, uh, who became a federal judge. And uh, Judge Pickering was very helpful. He's one of the few people still living that I was uh, able to, uh, to talk to. Uh, Tom Landrum died. Uh, just before Christmas in 2019. So, so many of the people uh, are dead now. But, uh, you know, from all of this, you're really able to develop a real portrait of who they were and what they were like. Uh, Sam Bowers, uh, I'd heard about for all these years. And finally, I moved back to the South and still working for the Boston Globe, I conned them into letting me uh, open up a bureau in New Orleans, and uh, uh, I had enough winners in Boston. So I was here for part of the 90s. I was working for uh, uh, the Globe. I had been in Jackson for the final trial of DeLay Beckwith in 94, and um, Bowers, served a few years for the Neshoba County case, but it was a federal case and they couldn't give him the maximum charges or conviction. So he had been out for a number of years and 
he had uh, gone through uh, four or five uh, trials in the Damer case and was never convicted. Uh, there were 14 people originally uh, indicted uh, and I think only four ultimately were convicted. Uh, anyway, uh, after the Beckwith conviction here, which I thought was one of the great redemptive trials here that they finally got back with uh, what, more than 30 years after he had murdered uh, McGrabbers, that there was a momentum in the state to go after some of these cold cases and some of these old guys who were still living. And Bowers was one of the main ones. And of course, Beckwood was convicted and spent the rest of his life in prison. So uh, uh, I got to know the Damer family a little bit when I covered the Bowers trial. And uh, I dealt primarily with uh, Ellie Damer, his widow, and Vernon Jr. and uh, enjoyed w uh, working with them. And uh, they were very helpful for my work as a reporter then. And um, Vernon Jr., after the Beckwith uh, trial, uh, made an appearance on Mississippi television and appealed for if anyone knew anything that would be helpful in prosecuting the people who were responsible for his father's murder to please get in touch with him. And he, he gave out a phone number. At that time, there was uh, a uh, guy living on the coast uh, who had become a gambling addict. His name was Bob Stringer, and he was, uh, he had been a teenager working for Sam Bowers uh, back in the 60s. And he had heard Bowers issue the Code 4 in the Klan parlance. That means he must be killed. This was the declaration that meant uh, Bowers must die. Uh, Bob Stringer heard this as a teenager and lived with it for a uh, number of years, and he happened to hear uh, Vernon Damer Jr. make this appeal. He was going through a recovery program that uh, had one of the steps, if you have wronged someone, you need to make amends, and he felt he needed to make amends to the Damer family, and he began calling and talking from a payphone so it couldn't be traced with Vernon Jr. and finally agreed to, uh, to testify. So he gave the prosecution you know, this extra information that they needed and I got to know Bob and uh, he was so tortured by the whole thing that Bob later took his own life so it was just there so a lot of tragedy in all of this, but uh, finally Bowers is being uh, brought to trial, and that's my one brush with Bowers. Uh, so the first day of the trial, he comes in, he's got on what looks like a nice, elegant uh, uh, court suit or something, and the judge, who's a terrific guy named Dickie McKenzie, he agreed to let the reporters go into his chambers to sit in on the jury selection. And there were about six or seven of us who were covering the trial. So we sat around this big table and I suddenly look and who is sitting right here? It's the Imperial Wizard, Sam Bowers. I sat next to him all day. He was wearing Mickey Mouse pins in both lapels. And I saw that his uh, suit was not nearly as elegant as it looked from afar. It was old and frayed. It was turning yellow. It was so dingy. And at the first recess, I thought maybe I would strike up a conversation with uh, the Imperial Wizard. So I said, uh, excuse me, Mr. Bowers, what's with it with Mickey Mouse? And he looked at me and he went, never said a word. He kept, uh, he was silent throughout the, the trial. So that's so much for my one attempt to interview the Imperial Wizard. Yeah, he, he was about as 
phoniest Wizard of Oz, you know, I mean, you know, uh, uh, he was, uh, you know, you learn from uh, so much material, and part of it is here in the state archives. There's a very valuable set of interviews conducted in the 80s for the archives that tell you uh, so much about Bowers and his perverted sense of religion, you know, and he had this philosophy it was called Christian militancy, and basically it authorized murder if murder was necessary. Uh, he was you know, you know, ardent racist and uh, just a, a really bad guy. Um, so, you know, those are the three principal characters in, in my book are... Uh, you know, two good men, Vernon Damer and Tom Landrum, and one very evil man, uh, Sam Bowers. But there are a lot of other characters in the book. Most of them developed uh, through uh, Tom Landrum's eyes and what he wrote about them. And some of them I knew by reputation. Uh, what's amazing is you consider the characters involved with the White Knights that, uh, you know, happily, well, I grew up in Pike County, and by 1964, I was gone. I'd gone through Ole Miss, and I was working in Clarksdale. In 64, Pike County became known as the church-burning capital of the world, and the Klan there had uh, either bombed or burned about 25 black churches that had been uh, uh, places where the blacks were going to for voter registration activity. So uh, evil lived in Pike County, my home county, too. Um, but it was, you know, Bowers, people uh, in the Delta, at least in Clarksdale, we didn't have a Klan. We, it, it, Citizens Council basically controlled everything, and they were at least smart enough to know that the Klan was very counterproductive, that virtually everything they did you know, backfired. You know, the murders in uh, Neshoba County were, you know, the worst thing they could have done. It was horrific, and it motivated so many white people to turn against the, this whole uh, aura of violence that was going on in the state. So um, uh, I was not so much aware of uh, the, the Klan activity, but I always you know, was contemptuous of the people in the Klan. I figured they were, you know, all these, uh, you know, uneducated bigots and uh, uh, trashy people. But I learned that there was a, it was a very diverse group of people. There was certainly some, uh, you know, poor, uneducated whites who were just resentful. And there were some whites who were regular business people who joined uh, either because of their racism. Some of them joined because it was just a men's club, they thought. And uh, they got into it for the camaraderie of having somebody to get together with. Uh, yeah, I learned that you know, there were a number of elected officials, uh, like the circuit clerk and and. Uh, Jones County and the circuit clerk in Forest County, who Damer was working so uh, often at cross purposes, uh, if not a Klan guy, he had the, one of the worst reputations uh, in the state. And that was back when we had literacy requirements. And he bragged that he would never, uh, he would see that no black was ever registered to vote in Forest County. He said he could ask questions such as, how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? And uh, so there were no blacks registered there. Thank you, Theron Lynn was his name, a fairly infamous figure. So uh, if you look at the ranks of the Klan, I discovered that uh, there were a lot of ministers in the Klan, some of them were kind of chaplains. And then, you know, we've got, uh, Preacher Killen, who eventually was convicted in connection with the uh, Neshoba County murders. He was a, you know, kind of outlaw Baptist minister and uh, helped uh, 
orchestrate that terrible thing. Uh, in Laurel, there was a guy, I remember his name, he became quite well known. His name was Cecil Sessom, and he too was a, uh, a minister. His nickname in the Klan was Little Preacher. And he drove one of the cars. He was one of the leaders of uh, the raid on Damer's uh, house. That's something, it's, if it weren't so tragic, it'd be very comic because that raid on the Damer home was an example of what a bunch of fools these guys were. I mean, they were in help. They were inefficient. Uh, they constantly screwed up their uh, their missions. They would, you know, determine they were going to uh, do something. They would shoot into the wrong home or maybe burn down the wrong home or, you know, uh, they were constantly messing up. So two cars were finally uh, dispatched to take care of the Damers. And they were going, uh, one car was going to burn down the home and the other car was going to burn down the little grocery store next to the home. It was a very cold uh, night for South Mississippi. It was January the 11th. And uh, they uh, uh, approached and they kind of reconnoitered the area and uh, they went to uh, a black cemetery. It was in the church that Vernon Damer belonged to. And Cecil Sessoms, before he led, he was the team leader. He and uh, a guy named Henry de Boxel from Laurel was driving the other car. Uh, Cecil Sessom went and urinated on these graves at the cemetery. And then they got in the car to attack the Damer home about one o'clock in the morning. They were equipped with uh, uh, they were all armed. They had uh, pistols, shotguns, and jugs of gasoline. Uh, and one car uh, hit the uh, family store where uh, uh, the Damer's old aunt, Aunt Rainey, lived in back of the grocery store. And they set that on fire. And the people in the um, uh, car driven by Cecil Sessoms attacked the Damer home. Among the attackers was a guy who uh, was a prominent businessman in Laurel named Cliff Wilson, who uh, eventually, you know, nobody ever knew for some reason he was on the raid. The JCs happened to name him a couple of years later, Man of the Year in Laurel. He was one of the people who threw jugs of gasoline into the uh, Damer home, uh, there was another character uh, in that car. His name was Billy Roy Pitts, and he was kind of a ne'er-do-well. He worked at a upholstery store. He um, um, loved cowboy movies, and so he designed for himself a quick-draw holster, and he had his gun tucked in there like a good old gunfighter, and then all the excitement to pistol fell out of his holster, left it behind. Meanwhile, uh, in the car, Henry de Boxer was driving, three other guys in there. They've got the store burning. The Damer home is burning. Uh, both cars are pulling out simultaneously. Well, one of the idiots in the car, Cecil Sussum, is driving. It's a guy named Lightning Smith. He thinks the other car are cops. So he opens fire and shoots out the tires of the second car. So they have to, this is classic example of what a bunch of idiots these people were. You know, and Sam Bowers didn't go on the raid, you know, he, these were his soldiers he had sent out. Um, so they have to abandon the one car. So eight of these guys climb into the other car and they're all, cursing and screaming at each other and ready to kill and finally they're limping back toward Laurel and um, Billy Roy Pitt says, uh, you know, hey fellas, I, we got to go back. He said, I dropped my gun. <laughs> so they're ready to kill Billy Roy Pitts too. 
but they don't go back. So they leave behind the two key pieces of evidence, you know, the pistol and, uh, and then the car, easily traceable. Uh, Tom Landrum heard about the mission the next day and heard that uh, one of the guys had uh, dropped a pistol. So he immediately uh, told the FBI that, you know, you need to look for the pistol because he thought it might have been uh, lost in, in somewhere in the embers of the uh, Damer home, which was burned to the ground and uh, left behind. But anyway, the uh, FBI was able to retrieve uh, the, the pistol and they were easily able to trace the car, which the owner worked out at Masonite and uh, he had loaned the, the car to Henry de Boxel to, to drive. and. So he had an alibi, but he wound up being caught up in the thing. But uh, based on uh, you know the evidence that we were able to co collect, and President Johnson also saw that another hundred FBI agents were sent to the state to investigate this latest crime. Uh, the FBI, because of Johnson, essentially forced uh, J. Edgar Hoover to do it sent 150 agents to the state uh, after Neshoba County. So you had the states kind of crawling with, uh, with FBI people, but, uh, and, and there were informants, uh, you know. In these FBI papers, I was able to read at the Southern Library, uh, you could tell it wasn't just Tom Landrum reporting, there were sometimes four and five different people who had joined the Klan and were reporting on them. Some of them were paid informants. Uh, there was one big Klan statewide rally in, uh, in Byram, and that's when the, uh, the FBI buzzed, the, you know, they knew about the meeting and they buzzed the meeting and helicopters and scared the hell out of all of them and they all went fleeing through the through the woods to uh, avoid being uh, being caught. And I know Tom Landrum went to that uh, big statewide rally and he was thinking, oh my God, you know, they're going to have a picture of me in the paper. Uh, and he had slogged his way through uh, uh, a creek to escape and get back to the car. And uh, he told me Cecil Sessoms, you know, grabbed him because they considered Tom a very valuable asset to have because he worked in the courthouse and uh, kind of made sure he got in the car and so he he wouldn't be seen. But there were there were other good men, I hope, uh, who were involved in this uh, and were reporting on these people. You know, in the end, uh, fairly early because of the clumsy people involved in the uh, the raid on the Damer home, uh, there were 14 arrests made within about two months, uh, and Sam Bowers was one of them. They didn't get everybody. There were a couple of them, including Cliff Wilson. He finally got indicted uh, within hours of being honored at a big banquet by the JCs to give him his Man of the Year award. So uh, he finally was uh, was caught and arrested and he wound up being convicted. Only a handful of them were actually convicted, I think in part because, you know, the jury lists were salted with uh, uh, Klansmen who would serve on the juries. You remember back then, uh, uh, women couldn't serve in our juries and it was uh, only white men who served on our juries. And uh, so, it was, different and very troubled time, but it was, uh, uh, it took, you know, 32 years to finally convict uh, Sam Bowers in this case. Uh, quite often, uh, people had to turn to the federal government to arrange prosecutions because the federal government could at least fall back on some civil rights uh, laws, but they couldn't, you know, go after them in uh, capital cases and murder cases where they could be sent away for life. And the state officials, the law enforcement people, 
were not uh, interested in prosecuting these cases. So, you know, we, we really had to look to, you know, back then the hated federal government for relief and for, you know, justice in these cases in the federal courts and for the FBI and for all the problems I have with the FBI. You know, they, uh, they provided uh, a lot of help. You know, Hoover was no help. Hoover couldn't stand the movement. Hoover uh, thought it was infested with communists and uh, it was basically President Johnson demanding that he send uh, send people to Mississippi, but uh, uh, you know they they eventually did their work. Uh, one other interesting thing I discovered: uh, they were the FBI was involved in several highly illegal uh, activities themselves, and they rationalized it by saying we had to do this. This is the only way we could fight the Klan. And one of the ways was uh, after they were, they had determined who the key figures were within the White Knights, they brought in uh, from New York a mafia hitman named Gregory Scarpa, who was also an FBI agent, an informant. Uh, agent is wrong, but informant. And uh, he had been involved in a number of murders in New York, and they basically waived all of that if he would uh, report to them. And so uh, and I've got the papers, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, teletype message from FBI office, Jackson to FBI in New York, send us agent so-and-so or informant, and it had a code number for Gregory Scarpo, says we need him down here. And they sent him. And they gave him for two accomplice, accomplices, two thieves from uh, Jones County who uh, were facing serious charges. And uh, he, they had the gang of three and they showed up at a TV shop run by a guy named Lawrence Bird who was one of the ranking uh, members of the White Knights. And the FBI felt he was, they saw some weakness in, in Bird. Bird didn't like Bowers. And Bird was upset that the Damer raid had been carried out without the approval of uh, other leaders of the White Knights. So, you know, most of the white knights didn't know that this raid was going to take place. You know, they were constantly de de denouncing uh, Damer. But, you know, Tom Landrum had no idea this raid was going to take place, and neither did Lawrence Bird. And so it was clear from some of Tom Landrum's reports that he had openly questioned Bowers. So they thought he might be a link they would go after. So they brought in Scarpa and these two characters from Mississippi. And they approached him right at closing time of his uh, store. And Scarpa hammered him over the head. They frog marched him to the car and they drove him down to somewhere uh, around Camp, Camp Shelby. Uh, Scarpa stuck a pistol in uh, Lawrence Bird's now, this is the FBI operative now. And they beat the hell out of him, sent him to the hospital. But he, he agreed and he began talking to the FBI regularly after that. Scarpa went back to the good life in New York. Um, they also were responsible for a, a illegal tactic when the White Knights finally turned on the Jews in Mississippi. And it began a campaign uh, here in Jackson, Meridian primarily, bombing synagogues and the homes of rabbis. And uh, people involved with the Anti-Defamation League met with the FBI and said, what can we do? The FBI says, you can set up a slush fund for us, which is totally illegal too. And they used the slush fund to set up an ambush in Meridian where they ambushed a guy named Tom Terrence, who they knew 
from informants uh, uh, were coming to bomb the home of a Jewish businessman. And uh, they didn't say, halt, you know, you're covered or something. As soon as Terrence stepped out of the car, they opened up on him, a force of about 100 men. They had the, the roads blocked. Terrence somehow got back in the car. He was actually carrying the bomb, and he tried to escape, wrecked the car. He got shot up badly. Everybody thought he was dead. And they were, went into the car, and they discovered a young woman who's dead, who's his accomplice. Her name was Kathy uh, Ainsworth. And... Uh, she was a school teacher in the Fondren area here in Jackson. And she was wearing short shorts and on the bombing mission with the White Knights. So uh, that was kind of their, one of their last rides. And uh, so it's a, it's a tortured tale. And it's interesting, you know, there's a good exhibit here in the Civil Rights Museum about the the Damer case, but uh, anyway, why don't I wind up? I've got just short of 15 minutes to respond to any questions you, you might have. Malcolm? What becomes of the land Malcolm, I'll tell you what, if you'll hold on one second, let me bring you the microphone so everybody in the room and everybody watching the live stream can hear your question. So what becomes of the Landrum papers now? Good question. You know, the Landrum family owns them. I had access to them. Uh, they're back in their hands now. So uh, Mike Landrum uh, is one of the one of the people who would ultimately determine that. But you know, in 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 many ways, you know, uh, there's so much of the revealing stuff will be in the book. Uh, but it's a uh, it's up to the land groups. Other questions? I'll tell you what, I'm gonna take this opportunity again to ask a few from the live stream. Uh, you'll be interested, in addition to folks reporting in from Oxford, Starkville, Pascagoula, around Mississippi, there were also folks reporting from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, New York, um, and uh, India. Yeah, where is Gregory Scarpo today? In Washington, <laughs> as well as Joyce Ladner from Washington, D.C. All right. Okay, I certainly know that name. So, uh, Joanna Williams from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania asks, is it possible that some of these people named are still alive today? As far as I know, virtually everybody. That's certainly a question that the lawyers for my publisher, uh, uh, Norton, ask me. Uh, all of the major figures are dead. Uh, there are one or two people who are just minor periphery uh, characters uh, that I could not track down, but uh, uh, all of the major players are dead. And you know, of course, that uh, you know, if you're dead, you can't sue Norton for libel or something. But I'm an old journalist. I also know the ultimate defense is the truth. And you know, it's, uh, I, I think everything in, in the book is, is truthful. Ellen Wilson Brown asks, and I may be mispronouncing this name, Devors Nix was Bowers' second in command. Is he in the book? Is uh, Devors Nix? Uh, yeah. Is, is he, he alive? It, no, this is Ellen Wilson Brown asking, Devors Nix was Bowers' second in command. Is he in the book? Oh, oh boy, is he? He's all over the book. Devers Nix uh, ran a uh, cafe in Laurel called John's Restaurant, and it was the hangout for the Klan. It was in John's Restaurant where Bob Stringer heard uh, Sam Bowers deliver the Code 4 to have uh, 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 Damer kill. Uh, Devers Nix lived long enough to be a witness for Bowers at uh, the last trial. He had become, a, uh, once again, terrible tragedy, but comedy. Um, he, uh, he showed up 
with oxygen and uh, like he was on his last legs or something. Um, and he had escaped from being uh, uh, on high bond. And Jerry Mitchell heard about this. Somebody called and says, uh, Devers Neeks is out playing golf. <laughs> and he sent a photographer and got a picture of Devers Neeks teeing off somewhere. And so Dickie McKenzie, the judge, immediately slammed about a $100,000 bond on him. But anyway, he testified at the trial and we all thought he was uh, faking uh, his illness. Uh, turns out he died a few months later, but uh, he, one of, one of the things he said was um, uh, he had joined the Klan because it was a benevolent organization <laughs> that they uh, delivered crisp, Christmas basket to needy people at Yule time. So yeah, oh, uh, Devers Nix is one of the main characters. And pictures, pictures of Devers Nix and uh, a lovely guy, Devers Nix. Uh, there was one other incident in the trial. Uh, Bowers was defended by the Klan lawyer. He was a big time Klansman himself named Travis Buckley. And um, Buckley is interrogating one of the witnesses. And he says, and tell me, who was at that Klan meeting that night? And the guy says, well, Mr. Buckley, you were. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so yeah, Devers Nix is, uh, is very, very much so. I see a couple of hands up back over there. Uh, oh, there you go, okay. Uh, I'd be curious to know about your own situation. Uh, you, you started at the Clarksdale paper around 1962, I think you said. Uh, what were your own feelings about the South and racism? And um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's a personal thing, and I've, I've, I've written about it in, in one book. Uh, I had begun, you know, fortunately, I came from a different home uh, environment than. Uh, a lot of people, you know, my mother was a school teacher and she was a widow for a while and then she remarried a Presbyterian minister. So I, I grew up among books and, and education. And I should also point out that sitting here in the front row is, I call her my little big sister, Laura McGee. And she, Laura's mother and my mother were best friends. And, uh, you know, so I, yeah, I, I, I had certainly, you know, by 62, I, I, I knew segregation was wrong. I had worked upstate in New York one summer in an integrated situation. And by the time Meredith's situation came along, uh, uh, I was basically repudiating, you know, the Southern way of life, but I stuck with it, you know, uh, uh, Happy to say, you know, uh, the Sovereignty Commission, which papers are now at the archives here, they have a meager file on me. I felt it was a badge of honor. But Laura called and told me a couple of years ago, did you know your mother and my mother, their names are in the Sovereignty Commission files too, as potentially subversive school teachers? <laughs> and, you know, so anyway, no, I was uh, I was considered a liberal at Ole Miss uh, by the by '62. Uh, I you know I was really kind of a moderate, you know, William Winter type uh, Democrat. Uh, I finally you know just felt like I had to leave the state, and I did in '69. Said I would never come back, and here I am back, and very happy to be back. But. Uh, now, I guess I was an early apostate of, uh, you know, Mississippi politics and you know, proud to be called a, a liberal. I have a question <clears throat> um, from various sides. First of all, Jewish and been involved in the Jewish world for a long time. And we see a lot of guilt 
in the families, <clears throat> like what did you do? Like in Germany, come in contact with a lot of folks who have tried to fix the situation by going forward. What, what are the families of the people who've been named so far in the papers and the names like that you've given, what are their families like? Is it a burden, or have they tried to uh, go in a different direction to correct the wrongs, so to speak, like the sins of the fathers? Yeah, I, I may find out in Laurel tomorrow. I, I, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, I would assume that uh, you know God knows who's in my family background. You know, I certainly had a, 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 a racist uncle. I remember I would cringe when I would hear him use racial epithets. Uh, you know, most of us white people, you know, have that in our backgrounds if we're from Mississippi. So, uh, you know, you can't can't condemn people for what their cousins or their ancestors did. Uh, you know, do that do do they have guilt? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, quite frankly, I don't feel any guilt for you know having uh, some relatives who were racist. As far as I know, they never you know, bombed their house or something. But you know, uh, uh, they did kind of things that made me cringe. Uh, uh, so I, it depends. I don't know. There, I'm sure that there are probably some families there uh, who are carrying on the good family tradition. Uh, maybe they're not bombing or burning, but uh, maybe still using racial epithets and that sort of thing. It's, it's, a, it's a good question, but uh, it's up to the individuals, I think. Getting close to the edge. Don't okay. So far. We fall off the back of the... Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you so much for all the information that you have given us. Uh, I was in a personal relationship with, it was a working relationship with this wonderful white lady for almost 10 years. And one day I answered, well, she had a husband. And one day I answered the phone because she was busy with my children. And the voice on the other end, his very nice voice, calm and, and respectful, he said, I'm not going to call her name. Tell him this is Sam Bowers. So that was when I said his name in an, a com the company of someone else because I heard the name and they said, "Do you know who that was?" On the I didn't know who it was, but that's that's who it was. Yeah, no, no, he's so. not a good guy. Not a good man. You know. Curtis, in Mississippi Burning, there's a scene that I always thought was completely fictional, which was that uh, a black FBI agent beat somebody up in a cabin to try to get information. And of course, Jerry Mitchell has told us that that's not how the FBI got their information. But you just told us a story uh, that the FBI actually did get somebody to beat somebody up yeah. in a different context. Uh, Am I correct that it's completely fictional to say that there was actually a black FBI agent? Uh, my understanding is they were all white. There weren't many. Uh, I don't know. I, now I don't remember that movie that well. I know I had some problems with the movie, as a lot of people did. That it's a feeling that it glorified the work of the FBI and uh, minimized the, the work of other people. Uh, I mean, there were... Uh, uh, you know, and some of the informants that uh, helped break the FBI didn't come from stealthy investigative work, but money. You know, they, they, uh, you know, Jerry, I think, reported you know exactly how much they paid uh, for the leads that uh, uh, led them to the bodies in the Shelburne County. I think it was something like thirty thousand dollars, which was a hell of a lot of money back in 64. I know I was making about 4000 a year. And uh, newspapers 
report has always been underpaid, but uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, they were, you know, Hoover was not friendly toward the idea of black agents. They may have had some, there bound to have been some, but I suspect that that was highly fictional. But uh, Jerry would know better than me. We have come to the top of another hour. I know there are more questions that you may have. Happily, Curtis will be over at the table over here signing copies of his book, and you can ask any of those questions that you may have then. Thank you all for coming. I hope that you come back next week for Rob Ferguson when he's going to be talking with us about Providence Cooperative Farm. But for now, help me thank Curtis Wilkie for this fabulous work. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris.